Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel O'Connor. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Monday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel, Joel Elkanen, Dennis Dick with you as always. Busy day today. Uh, Deutsche Bank has some issues. We knew that. Boeing has more issues. We'll talk about those two. We'll talk about all the analysts coming out of their July 4th slumber. Uh, it, it helps that we have a couple quiet periods up today for some recent IPOs, but there are a lot of upgrades and downgrades to discuss today. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about Tesla and playing that if it's going to zero or not going to zero, how you could make money off of that trade. And our guest today, Alan Brockstein, author of the 420 Investor and founding partner of New Cannabis Ventures. He will join us at 8 at 35 to talk about the news from Canopy Growth on Friday and the news from CanTrust today. Joel, what is the word here in the overnight session? A uh, little bit more red on the screen than usual. Uh, S&P is trading down seven handles here at 29.83.50. Uh, your pre-market high is just above your close at 94.75. Good target on the upside. On the downside, 78.75. Really don't see anything there, folks. Uh, to me, the main number for today and the key to continuing this rally, Friday's low at 71 and a quarter. Uh, crude in the red by 16 cents at 57.35. Gold back above 1400.850, up 850 at 1408.60. Silver back over 15 dollars, up 10.9 cents at 15.11. And I did see Bitcoin up a little bit higher, but now it is. Uh, let's see if it's still in the green here. Uh, rebounding from yesterday's action and it is up nine hundred dollars at twelve thousand one hundred and forty the weekend but, rally yeah the weekend rally you know what i had the uh the SIBO uh future up there and i gotta get rid of that it's no longer around but man is that volatile dennis right back at the highs here in bitcoin you still sticking with that 20k prediction yeah i think so i think eventually bitcoin's going back to the highs like i said i'm not a crypto trader i've never made a crypto trade but we've been calling it pretty good i'm gonna stick with the bull train that's just the technical is all you have because you know the from a fundamental perspective there's nothing to analyze there's no right. cash flows there's no revenues there's nothing to analyze there so i just look at it from a technical perspective as long as it's above 10,000, hold them and then bounce there. I mean, this is performing yeah. very well technically still. So I don't see why not. I don't see why not. It can't hit all time highs. Uh, the future is interesting here. The high on Friday was uh, 1223, your current high 1222. So if you're uh, if you're trading those Bitcoin futures, keep an eye on that. The high of the move that you had here in the uh, in the Merck contract when we got a little carried away with things, uh, that high was at 14,175. So uh, here we are. Uh, not really a long weekend, but uh, kind of a long end. Of it the felt week. like a long weekend, though. It felt like, uh, I, like I said, I feel semi-retired here because I had so many days off last week, half day here, day off here, Canada Day on Monday, which I took the middle of the day off. I mean, yep. I'm like just in full chill mode here. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I'll be here for the remainder of the week, but I'm going to get a week off. Uh, Where are you going? Going to, the, going to Harbor Springs, Michigan, going uh, up north for the annual family trek, so Look at nice. that, do a little golfing, a little bit of swimming here. But uh, what do we want to cover here? I mean, do you want to go right to that <laughs> Apple downgrade here? Or? The, the ratings, okay, so obviously it was a holiday week for the most part last week, so we didn't get a lot of analyst ratings. They have come with their upgrade, downgrade shoes on here this morning because we have a lot of ratings. Let's start right with the ratings. Maybe, Spencer, you can just fly through a few highlights here, and then Joel and I can cherry pick what we want to talk about. All right. Well, like I said, it is helped by the fact that you have the uh, Fiverr and CrowdStrike analyst quiet periods up today. So a lot of initi uh, initiations there. The biggest rating you're going to see today is the Apple uh, downgrade. That was from uh, Rosenblatt this morning, downgrading Apple to sell. Uh, not the most influential firms, but it is notable because it's Apple. You don't see a ton of Apple downgrades. I think the last Apple downgrade we got was... Let's see. Um, 
all April, uh, HSBC. So you don't see a ton of Apple downgrades, especially to sell. So you'll see that Rosenblatt downgrade talked about a lot today. No, for no, no other reason than that. Uh, what else do we have here? Well, we do it one at a time. Let's, let's just right. bang them out Apple. because it's like Apple. I mean, that's the big dog here. Ha, I don't know. It's had a nice run, has earnings at the end of the month. I mean, they, it seems like uh, it's funny because I came in and Luke said Apple got a downgrade. And I'm like, oh, was that because they're expecting weak iPhone sales? It seems like it's just you hear this stuff or they heard from suppliers or, you know, it seems like you hear this before earnings quite a bit. It's had a great run. It's been consolidating near the top. It's trading down uh, 279 in the pre-market. I'll just look at the low, uh, maybe just 200. Maybe that'd be a good psychological level. We're a buck 44 above that. So I guess good to go north. It's going to uh, see to hard, hard for it to rally back. The high of the move was made on Friday at 205.08. Pair closes at 204.30 area. So, I mean, running out and shortness off a, a couple. I think 200 too. I, so let's yeah. see what it does there. I probably test it. Probably one of the easier trades of your day trade might be to short it. And rebuy it when it gets down to 200, because almost always seems like they want to test these big numbers there. They can act like magnets. So I think you might see a test of 200. Uh, but, you know, that being said, um, who, who knows really how it's going to respond? Um, the one thing to consider is that it kind of broke out. You know, we kind of trying to break out. But breakouts, we've been talking about. Gil Morales has talked about this on the show. Breakouts really haven't been working. It's been buy the dip and sell the rip that's been working. Like if you just look at the overall market in the last year and a half, we really have had a lot of chop. I mean, you can say, okay, yeah, we had a pretty, you know, good hit there back in December. We had a really good quarter back at the beginning of this year. We had a really crappy May, a really good June. But it seems like you get these one, two, three week moves and then it kind of fades and then you get a lull or you get a counter trend move in the overall market. And really when you put it in perspective, the fade trade in the last two years has been the fade. When you're seeing something move up, you know, five, ten percent over the course of a week or two, it seems like the fade trade is what's been working, or something's moving down five or ten percent, disappointed, eventually it turns around. So I don't see any reason to like be chasing stocks in this environment. This is a contrarian call by Rosenblatt, so which is a fade trade, which so I don't mind it. So I'm kind of on board with this one to a certain extent. I still own Apple in my long term portfolio. As an investor, I'm not going and hitting the, the, the sell button because of this. But as a trader, I'm taking note. And I think if you know, it starts to cut through 200, then you start to get concerned. Uh, what, we hit a low of 170 on June 3rd. And, you know, you can't. going to get run. Yeah. I mean, you hit 205 on uh, uh, on Friday, a high of the move when the spoos didn't make a high of the move. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're nervous going into the report, I mean, you still got – I think it's July 30th that they report still. You still got some time. And, they, you know, the, really for the company, too, it's like it's not all about iPhone sales. I mean, their services, their, uh, you know, the other things that they're trying to do, the Apple News or app. Well, they haven't done the Apple TV yet, but. Uh, and well, I'm, they have Apple TV, but they haven't really went <laughs> any further with it. I mean, there's a lot of irons on the fire. We know that just like Google. Lots of irons on the fire there. Eventually, they'll get more revenue streams. A lot of smart people still work at Apple. I right. still believe in the company long term. Yes, it's still an iPhone company, but it's a huge cash cow, and they make so much money. I think eventually they're going to find something else to do with it. And uh, and if you think about it, the only other thing to uh, keep in mind is maybe some other analysts hop on this tomorrow or the next day. You know, sometimes you see that analysts get going. You Sometimes. know, one, one way or another, but uh, we'll keep an eye on it. Currently trading down uh, 286 at 201.37. Mr. Right. Israel, this is to go to the next one. Some, uh, well, it's funny because it's like mostly downgrade this morning. There's like two downgrades for every upgrade. Um, I'm looking go for into the where I want to go is the DA Davidson note on Lamb oh. and Applied. Okay, yeah, there is a big note from D.A. Davidson. Uh, Lamb Research, actually, uh, I'll just read off all the downgrades here this morning because there was a bunch. Uh, D.A. Davidson is downgrading Lamb Research to neutral, downgrading uh, CLI, KLIC, excuse me, uh, to neutral, downgrading ICHR to neutral, uh, Applied Materials to neutral, and AEIS to neutral. So uh, downgrading the 
weeks. You call it semi- Dave Davidson getting bearish on the series. Uh, getting bearish on the semis. Lamb Research and Applied Materials are, are the two biggest ones. Lamb Research, they cut their price target from 225 to 220. Uh, applied Materials price target cut from 55 to 45. So AMAT and LRCX are the two biggest names from that note. Yep. I think, uh, and I've said this already, I think we saw we, we saw the top and the chips uh, there four days ago. When what was the catalyst that day when we were taking off? It was Micron was obviously the catalyst that kickstarted a, the huge chip rally. But then you had that one last day. Oh, the the Huawei news. Yeah. The Huawei news. So I don't know. I look at that and I think I, I think we saw upside capitulation when Micron went from thirty two to almost forty two dollars in a matter of five trading sessions. It was just overdone. That's why I sold my Qualcomm. Um, I also sold, I sold another one in there too. The only chip stock I have, I have a little bit of Micron left and the other one I have a little bit of is NVIDIA, but both small positions. I've sold my applied materials. I've sold my, I had AMD for a little bit, but I didn't make any money on it. It just wasn't running. I sold my Intel. I sold, I, I don't know. I had them all at one time. Western Digital, I sold that one too. I mean, they just got a little bit overdone in my opinion. It was a really rip and run there for about a week and a half and i think i sold my qualcomm too so i just think they all got overdone i think we saw the top i think rallies are to be sold in most of these things now so now you're getting downgrades applied material uh, i'm not interested in buying these because i feel like we saw the rip and rally there it needs another catalyst now and i don't know what that catalyst is to really kickstart us and take us up again can i ask a stupid question yeah you really know the difference between all the chips at all these companies? I, I trade them all together. I don't even know if it matters the difference. I mean, I know LAM and Applied are more related. So, like, when I see an Applied Materials, like, move, I know the direct peer is LAM Research, but they all are related to each other to a certain extent. Okay. So, obviously, you got NVIDIA and AMD and Intel are all closely related. Micron's DRAM, and it's got a little bit more. But, I mean, they all move. Western Digital and Seagate move very closely together. So, if you want to, like, pair them up, those are the ones that are, but they all kind of move together. So you can hedge, you can do all kinds of funny things, you know, around them. But, you know, just look at your SMH components. You know, that's the easiest way to do that, too. And maybe in some cases, it's just easier to look at that, too. SMH has had a pretty good pullback from the highs, though. So and so is Western Digital here now. So or a little bit. And then if you look at applied materials, we're off, too. So I feel like the downgrade's a little bit late. But you're kind of in the middle of nowhere for me, too. So I think I'm just sitting on my hands on both of these stocks, Applied uh, and Lamb. If you look at uh, if you look at the monthlies here, and that's all I'm going to do because we're giving a longer-term perspective <clears throat> here. I mean, for LRCH, LRCX, I mean, there's just a wall uh, of resistance at 200. Get that off the rebound here. So I don't think this thing's busting out the new all-time highs anytime soon. I mean, on the downside, you did have a lot of support here in the 170. 174 area so kind of been a little bit of a range not looking for a big breakdown until you break into the 160 handle but uh i don't know i mean it they're well off their all-time highs lrcx made its all-time high back in april of 2018 so let's just take a look at amat uh amat had that nice pop as you said probably a lot of people trapped in this one trading down 97 cents i mean they're not clean looking charts like they were no. when they had that run up from 16 to 18 so that's the only thing it's, it's just not the same trade yeah it's going to be tougher because we had and we have people caught from four days ago where they were all buying you know the, the, they're chasing one thing I'm going to say again, I've said it already once on the show today, I'm going to say it again, is if you're chasing in this environment in the last year and a half, you're getting hurt. If you're you know, seeing a stock that's moving up 10 15% and you're throwing in your swing portfolio, you're doing it wrong. Fade trades is the way the last two years has worked, um, where you've seen moves up 8 10%. It's the fade that has been working better than chasing. When you're seeing a stock you know, rally that much and you're buying it at that point in time, you're late to the party. You're hopping on the train late. In some market environments, it works, chasing. But you know, for the most part, you know, at least in this market environment, chasing has not been working. Hey, look at what that Broadcom did. Uh, it stuck its head over 300 for, uh, you know. One yeah, day. and then they had the news. So, yeah. But still, I mean, that was a huge move too. And Broadcom's right in the mix here when we're talking the chips. I mean, it was a huge move. And obviously got back. But you, you think about it, too. Like, you look at these moves and put them in perspective. Because these June moves were just retracing the down moves in May. 
I mean, these were big down moves. Micron got hit hard in May. It went from 43 down to 32 and then all the way back up. So when you get back to where you had all this overhead supply before, it's kind of logical that you're probably going to stall out. And that's what we did. I mean, Qualcomm, when it got back into the 80s, three, four days ago, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm out. And you know why? But there's two reasons. One, I had a loss aversion a little bit there in my longer term portfolio, you know, but everybody else I'm thinking is doing the same thing. So I think you get a chance and there's a lot of, you know, different, you know, there's a lot of, you know, headline risk in Qualcomm. We've talked about that already because so many other things going on there, but I just think, you know, we had the big run. It was a nice four day move. And if you were up and you know, in those stocks, it was a time to lock in some profit on that one day that we decided to open up four or 5% of these stocks again. Uh, while we're on the subject, we should mention that Bloomberg reported last night that uh, Broadcom secured financing uh, for their semantic acquisition. Is it, is it, have they announced a price yet? Uh, no, you know, I don't believe they I have. I don't think it's an official deal. Nothing here. is official, but you had the report last week and then you have the report last night that Broadcom got the money for it. So the SY, SYMC. It's up a buck. Up, yeah, up, up 4% here. David Faber was on CNBC saying he does not think, I remember him saying this a couple uh, you know, last week. And obviously, out of everybody on CNBC, Faber is probably one of the most connected. So when he says something, he's fairly connected. And he says he does not see this deal with, uh, with a three on it. He thinks it's going to be like under $30, the final price. And, you know, I don't know where it's going to be. Obviously, the stock was $22 when the rumors started. So this could be one of those. And maybe it's only like 27 bucks. Maybe it's a deal and mostly stock and AVGO gets hit again or something. And then it doesn't even look as attractive. But... You know, that's a lot of, you know, wild cards there. We don't know what the price is going to be. It sounds like there's going to be a deal. But when you're buying it up here at 26 now, you know, maybe there's not, you know, as much upside as there was obviously last week before we knew that the deal was on the table. Really not even a huge premium to where it was trading before. Like it was, I mean, it did have the nice run up from under $19, but it was trading around 22. So it's really not a huge premium being paid in the deal. Well, we don't know what the premium is. We're guessing on that. So we can't say that because we don't know what the premium is yet. We're just saying that we don't think it's going to be $30, but I don't know if I bought a 22 and 26, it's not bad. It's a 20% premium, Joel. It's not bad. Uh, I guess because it's a nothing to sneeze. Bad. I used to think yeah. it's because a twenty dollars stock. Yeah, the four bucks doesn't seem like a lot, but yeah, but you know, still, it's still twenty percent premium if they come out twenty six or twenty seven bucks. Maybe Kramer was thinking it was going to be twenty nine, but I think he was just throwing numbers out there. Faber kind of thought like he he was when they were, were having that segment. He kind of thought it was going to be lower than that. So I don't know if you're coming in here now. I just feel like you're buying at twenty six. I don't know. They got risk. What if they decide, okay, no, all of a sudden they got the financing. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. But I mean, I think you got a buck or two upside, maybe, maybe. And then if it's an all stock deal, then do you have, you know, really much upside at all here? I don't know. Maybe they come up with a 30 and, and maybe, you know, David Faber is wrong. And then, you know, this, it's going to be a good buy at 26. But I think you're coming in here now speculating on a big payday. I think a payday already kind of happened. And uh, you don't really hear much about other suitors for this, you know, like a little bidding war or anything. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, there hasn't been any M&A in the cybersecurity sector in a long time, if I can remember any of it. I mean, we did see a lift in a few of the, simp- the other stocks there last week. Like I said, I was playing a couple of them, but I'm out of all those trades. FireEye, we saw a little bit of life there, you know, on this deal announcement. Got up about 5% the next day. Palo Alto Networks and Cyber, CYBR. Show a little bit, but really not much. I mean, this kind of came out of the blue. I think this is a one one and done type deal. I think you know, I, I don't think there's going to be all of a sudden a lot of these cybersecurity stocks getting scooped up. Uh, why don't we go to uh, Goldman? Didn't uh, Goldman uh, downgrade uh, F5 Networks today? Is that yes, correct? Did. did I see that? Yes. Uh, did see that. Yep. They downgraded F5 to sell. Lower the price target from 165 to 120 Hmm. The stock's going to open down significantly. So I know it hasn't traded. There's some odd lots trading. This is offered right now. There's an odd lot at 142.75 offered. There's more stock offered heavily at 143. This is going to open down near 140. So this is going to get hit hard. So I know you're coming in, you're saying, oh, it's not moving yet. There just hasn't been a trade. This is heavily offered in the 143 handle. So you're looking like 142 and below. So I wouldn't be surprised to test 140. 
And I wouldn't be surprised either. You had one, two, three, four lows, uh, right? This is called like 140 and a quarter uh, surrounding all those lows. Uh, the only problem is if it doesn't hold this 140, your next daily low is 135.13. But uh, just when you have four lows uh, in the same area here, going back just at the uh, middle end of June here, a look at that is uh, a temporary support or a good number to keep an eye on for the remainder of the day. We also had Verizon getting a downgrade this morning Ooh, from yeah. Citigroup down yeah. just to neutral. So nothing crazy here. Stock's down 1%. I mean, that's the move you typically see when a stock as big as Verizon or AT&T get downgraded or upgraded. So I don't know. I mean, you've got room down to 57 I wouldn't be surprised, but if you get down there near that, you know, 50, you know, those couple lows I'm looking at, Joel, you can probably tell I'm looking that low 56.60 from July 1st and 56.1. Yep. I you know, maybe get down there and test it, but I think you find buyers down there too. Like these stocks, here we are, you know, interest rates don't sound like they're going up anytime soon. So, you know, and that sounds like they're still going down. I mean, we can talk about that move on Friday after the jobs number, which is giving you a tell that, you know, this market still thinks interest rates are going down considerably in the future because the XLU got it all back and the banks that were rallying on that in the morning faded. So, you know, here's a classic bond trade, you know, kind of moves along with the TLT. They're always in it for the dividend. I don't think, you know, this is uh, that job zone was enough to spook everybody out of these kind of stocks. So I think you got underneath demand in this. I think you get in the 56 handle. I think people are coming and buy Verizon. You know what? Uh, we kind of we kind of messed up on uh, AT&T and Verizon again, Dennis. Uh, they go X dividend tomorrow. Oh, do they? Yeah. Yep. Oh, we got to look further ahead. Look yeah. at the run AT&T. This is going to set up well. I Look at the run AT and T has had into the X dividend date here. Once is it really X dividend tomorrow? Yeah, I, just, I didn't know that. Yeah, I looked, Verizon's had a little bit of a run, but AT and T has had a hell of a run. I We've know. talked about this trade on this show for five years, <laughs> and it's been some of the easiest money out there, where you're buying it two, three weeks ahead of the X dividend date, or even a week ahead of the X dividend date, and then selling it and selling it short afterwards. So uh, this is going to set up well, I believe. You know, we'll see what happens. You know, it goes X dividend tomorrow. Yeah, July 9th. So, I mean, that's the, the trade is you should just sell out of your long, at least, you know, prior or, you know, on that morning, and then to sell it short usually. So AT&T has had a nice run here. I actually like to set up to short this tomorrow morning after the X dividend day. We'll see what it does today, though, because it might keep running a bit before that. Yeah. Very unusual moves, especially for the uh, for the AT and T. So we'll see what happens. I mean, usually you get uh, if they're going to do that, they usually reverse pretty quickly. So we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, AT and T has gone from what thirty and changed over thirty four dollars. So always, always stock. I always tell Dana to buy and shoot. She just won't listen to me on it. So uh, I've sold my AT and T. Yeah. I'm yep. on the opposite coin. I had it in my portfolio for a long time. Got paid dividends for a long time. It really never went anywhere, but I was getting paid 4 or 5% of my money forever. I don't think I lost on it. It was a weird one, though, because I had for so long I had all those spinoffs. Oh, I got yeah, AT&T Wireless, and then I got – what else? It was like four companies I got. I finally sold my Lucent the other day. <laughs> well, that's – you had so long ago. You even had Lucent Technologies from it <laughs> yeah. going way the hell back. I mean, AT&T, if you held it long enough, you got a lot of little companies off of it. But there was there was when they did that uh, that spinoff. It was like the one back in like 2007 or 2008 when they got AT and T Wireless, and then there was another company in there too. What was the other company? Um, there was like four companies that spun on itself. Avaya? Off. Was yeah, that? Yeah, Avaya. I think so. I only know that because my dad was working there. <laughs> I think so, and that's off the board now too. So, anyways. It's weird, you know, to go back and look, you know, I definitely made some money with it. But the reason I'm out of it now is just I just think the competition is just going to be coming from. I know it's a nice dividend, 5.96%. I know it trades like a bond. I don't think it's imminent that this thing's in any trouble at all. But we've talked about this on the show, and I've given my arguments against holding AT&T that yeah. I just think in the longer run, there's a lot of issues here, and there's a lot of debt, too. So I don't like it as a long-term hold, but I think there's safer plays. If you're looking just to get 5.9% of your money, there's actually safer plays, and those safer plays are in different preferred stocks of better companies. So I don't see a lot of upside. I see that potential risk in the long term that, you know, this debt is really hitting them hard. 
you know, the, the cord cutting is on some of their businesses. Obviously, they have a lot of other businesses there too. But I also believe, you know, the whole wireless, I, I think, you know, internet is going to get cheaper here in the long, long term too. There's a lot of companies coming for them in competition that way too. So uh, I'm concerned long term on AT&T. And, uh, you know, when will it uh, reap any benefits from the big deal that they did, right, with Time Warner? You know, they have the pipe. I mean, they, they have a history of just overpaying for companies. The DirecTV purchase was a disaster. Oh, disaster. I mean, I don't know why, you know, Dish all of a sudden is in play. I don't get who wants to buy these companies because there's just, I don't see the need for, you know, going and everybody's going to all of a sudden, you know, be subscribing. We're gonna, where's the growth going to come with something like Dish? Everybody's cutting the cords. They're cutting their, not only their cable cords, they're cutting their satellite cords too. Why do you need that? I mean, I find myself, you know, I, I have cable because, you know, I want to watch my CNBC and, you know, I've got to watch that, you know, because obviously there's market information from that. But for the most part, you know, if I didn't, you know, like sports and I like my watching my sports too, and I don't like streaming sports because I don't find it's quite as good, but for, eventually it will be just as good. And eventually I'll probably be able to stream all this stuff. And at that point in time, what the hell's the point to having a cable bill? So that's why, like with Comcast stuff, I know they have other businesses, you know, that's the argument there, but it's a big money cash cow for them too and it's scary to hold these things and those businesses i think are are, are dying eventually wow i just t- took a look at comcast when you mentioned it look at this 44 dollar level uh not one month not two months three months in a row you peaked just under 44 dollars uh this much you've come a little bit shy of it 44 is your exact all-time high that was made in January of 2018. So if you're a long-term Comcast holder here, boy, up near the uh, all-time highs, which has uh, been tested on several different occasions. So we'll see what happens with uh, Comcast, but uh, just slow, stodgy stock that doesn't have quite the dividend that AT&T and Verizon do. No. But- and, and Comcast has other business. They all have other businesses. We know that there's content there. there. It's not like these things don't have, you know, aren't diversified. They have a lot of stuff. I mean, but some of their core businesses, I believe, are still going to be under attack and, and remain under attack. And that's why it's hard for me to just get bullish on stock like Comcast or AT&T. Okay. All right, Spencer, we got um, a few more minutes to balance. His SPs are just quiet. They're just sleepy. I mean, that's all I can say. Down 675, 2980. What do we got the catalyst here overnight? Do we have like a, I know Deutsche Bank, we haven't even talked about it yet, and it's getting hit here now. Deutsche Bank is very interesting because it actually was trading higher this morning, very early on this, on this, all this restructuring stuff over the weekend. Can you just go to the pro here and give us the highlights there, Spencer, from Deutsche Bank? Yeah, Bank's? I was going to segue by saying that uh, I had this long segue plan, but now it's irrelevant. I ruined it for you. All right, uh, Deutsche Bank, <laughs> we knew this was coming uh, as late as last week. Uh, they said so. This is the biggest restructuring in the company's history. They are cutting 18,000 jobs, <laughs> exiting the global equities, sales, and trading business, not paying a dividend for the next two years. <laughs> they are uh, projected to uh, lose uh, uh, 2.8 billion euros in this quarter or in the second quarter of 2019. That's a lot of euros. Uh, so, a lot of stuff hitting the fan. Uh, yesterday is when they announced it. And I'm sure there was more to come. Just, uh, you know, and we knew all this stuff was coming. That's why the stock is not really getting hit that hard. I mean, a lot of stuff we know there's got problems here and they're trying to fix those problems. Slash employees are trying to cut expenses in whatever way they can because they've got a lot of problems. They're talking about having, you know, a lot of assets thrown into a bad bank. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, wild things going on here right now. What does that mean for the stock? I don't know. I mean, uh, in the long run, uh, none of this is good news. But in the short run, they're looking at saving money. And this, some of these measures are going to save money. So could they eventually applaud that? Or could they uh, later? They were applauding it this morning to a certain extent. Like I said, it actually was trading higher earlier. You can probably see on the overnight trading there, Joel. Yeah, it was uh, and it's leaked it right back down. And you really you think in the long run, none of this is good for the company in the long run. 
Uh, it's uh, trading in the red here by 27 cents at 776. And it just had a really nice rally along with the remainder of the market. I rallied from 661 and uh, got over $8 on Friday. So buck and a half move, three quarters. I mean, it's, it's about getting back half of the move at seven and a quarter, 730. You're trading the secondary market here. But I mean, you didn't think that this thing would have a 20% rally and go from 650 to eight and change. I really took my eye off it. But uh, historically speaking, I mean, just horrible. I mean, how can you get excited about this when the relative performance, I think we talked about this on Friday, uh, May of 2007, it hit 158.59, and here you are in single digits. I mean, how many times do, do stocks you know, make that kind of move and then and then recover back to I mean look at Bank of America or General Electric I mean we're talking different companies different but, but yeah yeah but the banks in themselves like really you know you've got a couple banks that have done very well like J P Morgan you know but Willie when you look at it I mean Citigroup's oh. never going to recover they 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 never a lot of these never really recovered from the financial crisis I mean when they were coming out you know some people were saying Deutsche Bank is well positioned after the financial crisis but really none of these stocks ever recovered. You know, people people say, "Oh, it's seventy dollars a share." Citigroup's come way back. No, well, it's being forgetting. The ten, was it ten for one or twenty for one reverse split? Was it what was it? I can't remember. One for ten. In, uh, in uh, Citigroup. Yeah, what was it? What's the all time high? That'll tell us. It's like five hundred bucks, isn't it? I think it was higher than that. I think it was one for fifty or something. No, it wasn't that much. It was one for twenty at the time. I think it was one for ten. I the all time high is five ninety one. There, so it was one for ten. Five ninety one. So this was the high back in 2000. These bank, the Citigroup never recovered. You know, Bank of America has never come back to the highs that it was at before the financial crisis. Morgan Stanley, some of them have. Uh, some of them have. Like I said, J.P. Morgan, I believe, made a new all-time high. Yeah, J.P. Morgan has been the stud. Uh, it's been the stud. Jamie Dimon stock has been the stud. And, you know, maybe they learned from the whale trade. I don't know what they learned from. But anyways, they, they've come out of everything the better. Wells Fargo has always been more conservative, lower beta than the other ones there. But... You know, we've, we've digressed from the, the real problem, which is Deutsche Bank. And they're trying to fix those problems. They're, you know, you're getting rid of your whole equities business. I mean, they're doing this for a reason. It's because they are got problems. So what do you do when you got problems? You cut expenses wherever the hell you can. But, you know, when you think about this, do you really want to invest in businesses that are cutting costs, cutting costs wherever they can because they're in trouble? I don't want to invest in those businesses. So I have no interest in owning any Deutsche Bank whatsoever. Could it bounce? Could they applaud those efforts? Maybe. But uh, at the same time, there's still a lot of issues here, and I'm out. No no Deutsche Bank for me. No, ba no banks. Uh, for I have very few banks because I've said all along I don't like the Deutsche Bank wildcard. I feel like there's safer place, places out there. Why do I want to take unnecessary risks? You know, you, you can jump in and say, oh, I want, you know, my – you know, 3% dividend for my Citigroup stock. I went 2.5% dividend for my Citigroup stock. But I went through the financial crisis. You went through the financial crisis. We saw what happened. They never fixed any of those problems. Back in 2007, 2008, nothing got fixed. And this is all Peter Schiff arguments, right? But I mean, it's true. Nothing got fixed. They just dug the hole deeper, kept printing our, our way out of it. You know, we went from what, 8 trillion in debt to 20 trillion in debt to, you know, dig the hole as deep as we possibly can. And, you know, it's going to, they're going to continue to dig it deeper. So when you think about all those wild cards, why do I want to take a risk in a bank again? I got burned a little bit, you know, in the banks during the financial crisis, and I learned the hard way. I own a few of the Canadian banks that are a little more defensive, but I don't even own a lot of them. I'm more into, you know, and obviously, you know, both of our portfolios, Joe, we've been more defensive. We do some preferred stocks and some different things. But even when I'm buying preferred stocks, I rarely buy a preferred stock of a bank. Because I don't want to go in a preferred stock for five and a half, six percent and go through another financial crisis because we don't know. There could be another financial crisis. They never fixed the problems. They just band-aided them. So when those band-aids come off, there's still some major issues there. And uh, you just have to worry about uh, the U.S. exposure to the Deutsche Bank. I, I don't know what individual banks. There, there's major derivative exposure here. They're, they're a huge portfolio. So, you know, if this, does this help? Does this, you know, prolong? Yeah. You know, if they're going to cut costs and they're doing it for a reason, you know, obviously it's, it's to survive. I mean, they're, they're, they're cutting costs in order to survive. And the stock's not at seven from down from $180 all time high at seven bucks. If they don't have issues, there's just safer places for your money in my opinion than the banks. 
Uh, any look at uh, it balances have been quiet as of late. We got a minute here before we bring our guest. Gee, up. every single day for years and years, I feel like now there's 200,000 to sell. Some institution just sells it every single morning for like, I, I, I feel like I'm tired of this for two years. It's crazy. I've never seen one that long. Anyways, it's just a given. G has got 200,000 to sell this morning. Oracle, we've talked about this trend three or four days in a row. It's 81,000 to sell on Oracle. Somebody is dumping a piece of Oracle here over the course of the last week. You know, we obviously have the Nigerians always talk about, um, you know, and they look at their options. We look at imbalances in the same way. We try to figure out, you know, what is the big money doing? Somebody is lightening up on Oracle. And Oracle keeps going up. It's funny. Oracle, it seems like it opens at the low and then it starts to rally all day. And Oracle's really done performing well. There is some institution that is slowly just getting out of it, though, into this rally. And maybe it's a valuation call. I don't know what it is. I still own Oracle in my long-term portfolio. It's been an awesome stock. But when you look at it here, um, just when you look at it here from the imbalance perspective, it's how to sell it here for about the last week. Selling in the strength. And that's a good way to do it. All right. I want to bring on today's guest, Alan Brockstein. He is the author of The 420 Investor, founding partner of New Cannabis Ventures, longtime friend of the show. Uh, Alan, can, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. That's a good one. How's it going today? Already snuck in on us. You snuck in on us. Crazy this morning. Crazy. Crazy this morning. So uh, let's get first your thoughts uh, on Wednesday's big news. One of the faces uh, you could say of the cannabis industry is uh, out at his company, Bruce Linton, at Canopy Growth. What was your reaction to that headline? Uh, Well, so uh, just full disclosure, he's a a good friend of mine for the last five years and a client, uh, well, was a client of. New Cannabis Ventures. I mean, can, uh, Canopy is. Bruce isn't. Uh, so I have to say, uh, I'm not surprised. I wasn't surprised. I was saddened by how it went down, but not at all surprised. Uh, it's not so uncommon uh, for an entrepreneur who founds a company to clash with, uh, you know, as, as the company evolves to clash uh, with, with, with the owners, essentially Constellation. And that's what happened here. So going forward here, do you think this is something that the market, like, I mean, and, and just putting this yeah. in perspective, you know, Canopy Growth has had some issues here too. Um, sure. The stock in itself, it's, you know, really struggled here to really catch a bid for any reason. They hit this initially on it, then they bought it back here. The Kramers always argued this is best of breed. I know you've liked the company okay. as well. What are your thoughts here going forward with the new CEO? Yeah, so it's funny. You, you said it struggled, and I thought you were talking about fundamentally, which has, I think, been the case. And uh, I was just—I I don't know the fundamentals as well as you, so I leave that to you. But I just yeah, yeah, yeah. Struggle. So the fundamentals have been—I've used the word atrocious, and you know, it's all. Everybody's got a different perspective. A company has out of control financials, and they're the next Amazon, maybe. So uh, I, th- I think uh, this was about expectations from Constellation. And I, I saw that 8K go out right after Canopy Growth filed. I was like, oh my God. Uh, you know, because this really hit uh, Constellation's uh, uh, financials. And, uh, you know, they look at EPS, not necessarily long-term creation. And I think if you look at it from Constellation's perspective, they got a lot of uh, pushback from their shareholders. Their stock has not done well since they did this deal. Canopy has done well. Canopy's gone up. But Fundamentally, the company is disappointed on revenue a little bit. I think that's not necessarily all Canopy's fault, to be fair. Uh, Canada's really uh, challenged right now, which we can talk about. But, uh, but the, you know, there's a, <clears throat> one of the things I, I highlighted at the beginning of the year was that investors, in general, were going to look for more than just revenue this year, that they really were going to care about other operating metrics. And Canopy growth has just lost so much money. And we're not talking about just paper, stock comp, things like that. We're talking about actual operating cash uh, just vanishing. So, uh, not, you know, I, I think as a investor in, in uh, Campy Growth, I don't think one has to be concerned right now necessarily. It's unfortunate to lose the visionary, but the company's way more than, than Bruce Linton. And, uh, you know, I think the question will be, have all the pieces of the puzzle that they've put on, on, the, on the table are they the right ones and is it the right strategy? And I, I don't think there's any reason to be questioning uh, uh, the way it's come together, but the, you know, expect the company to have better financial controls. Uh, we're on the line with Alan Brockstein. He's the author of the 
420 investor letter. And I, I know you don't have the definitive answer to this, but when Constellation Brands makes this investment, and I can remember the stock got a huge pop off it. I mean, I, do they have covenants where they're just, they bought and they're in and they're in and they're in and they're in and they never could sell because- They, they could sell. Uh, no, they, they could sell. I mean, I think as a shareholder of, of Canopy Growth, one should take some comfort that they decided for them, whether it's the right decision or not, that to move forward, they, they should change management. And I, I expect that the next CEO is going to be a rock star. Uh, so- uh, I think there's something good to look forward to, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work out, but I, I don't think there's, uh, I, th I think that people should realize that Constellation is, is in this for the long term, and uh, they didn't walk away. They, they sure could have walked away if they wanted to. What do you mean by like a, like a rock star, like, uh, you know, mix? So, so, you know, uh, to be to be fair, I don't want to be too critical. Uh, it, the, can the Canadian cannabis industry is, quote unquote, leading the world, but the management teams there uh, are, are not world-class management teams. Not surprisingly, it's a, it's a startup industry. And we're getting a migration of, of really interesting people into the industry, probably more so in the United States than uh, in Canada. But uh, I, I think this is a real great opportunity. And, and just to give you a small example of how this happened recently, uh, Charlotte's Web, which uh, went public on, as a true IPO, in Canada uh, last year uh, at seven dollars, it trades uh, Canadian like twenty four right now. They, uh, you know, it was founded by the Stanley Brothers. They were wise enough to realize that they they didn't have the public company experience and management depth to necessarily take the company to the next level. They had a CEO who was capable pre public, but didn't appear to be the person to lead them as a public company. So they ended up hiring a woman, Dini Elsner, who has extensive global uh, CPG or uh, consumer packaged goods experience. And I think you'll see more of that in Canada. We've, we've already seen like Aurora kind of up their management team a little bit and bring in an outside advisor. I, I think that's something that investors should expect. It's happening more in the United States where you're seeing some really big people uh, from outside the cannabis industry migrate into it. We're going to see that type of situation at Canopy. And I think it'll really, I, I don't have any exact insight into this, but it's just my prediction that this is a really, a chance to get a really world-class leader. But, you know, it, it reflects a more mature company than, than the startup that Canopy has been to date. Is this still one of the, like, and you're looking at, you know, there's obviously a lot of different pot stocks to invest in here now. Kramer is on Mad Money and he touts this as best in breed. Uh, you yeah. Know, he's talking about it. What is your thoughts on this? Is this one of the best companies out there? Is Kramer right when he's saying this is best in breed? You know, uh, I'd say it has a best of breed valuation. And I think that's the challenge for people to determine, you know, what exactly is, is that $5 billion in the bank or roughly worth and uh, how are all those assets assembled? And uh, I, I'm a little bit humble when it comes to, to making these calls. And I would point to another company is really executing well enough to merit attention. And that's Organogram and, and their client in New Cannabis Ventures too, by the way. What's the I don't even have a big position right now. The stock's done really well. I'm just talking about the company, not the stock. Okay. And uh, so OGI, okay. but there's a company that really, and I'll give you another one, Trulieve in the United States. Now, who's to say that this is the best way to go about things, but these companies are profitable. And so when I think of best of breed, I think of a company, you know, companies that have been able to, uh, you know, establish their businesses profitably, they're growing, and they seem to be doing things the right way. So I think canopy growth, uh, I, I don't want to say it's not best of breed, but there's some questions. And I'd say, you know, people thought of Freo was best of breed, and it wasn't, or, you know, it doesn't appear to be. Uh, there's a lot, you know, several players in Canada. Uh, I would say that there's about six to eight that really have the capability when we look out five years from now to be considered one of the top three companies globally. What about the competition in Canada? Obviously we're full legal now. I'm seeing, you know, even down in the Leamington area, I know there's like two more growers down there yeah. that are starting to grow pot again too. I mean, this is, you know, when this first came out, it was what 30 licenses across like Canada. Now it's yeah, 189 now. So how, how many is there now? 
I think 189. 189. Think, yeah. So, so what happens? Like, I mean, these things, some of these had some crazy valuations. All of a sudden, the competition's coming. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, they're not all equal. You know, you can't say everybody's uh, license is equal. So, some companies have been licensed since 13 and some since, uh, you know, last week. Uh, some have access to capital. Some don't. Some have stellar management teams. Most don't. The, uh, the competition, I, th I think if you're a, a cannabis investor and you think, and all you look at is dried flour and how much you can grow and what price you're going to get, you're going to be a very sorry investor. So the companies that are going to be successful are the ones that can kind of navigate uh, uh, thinking about the cannabis as an ingredient and uh, the, the types of products that will be created. And so I think, uh, you know, that was kind of a free as demise, I would say, partially. Uh, they were really focused on we're going to be the best growers, period. And well, they're not. And that's not even the right thing to be necessarily. You want to uh, establish brands and products that stand out. The whole market's about to change. I'm really optimistic about can. I know there's a lot of pessimism right now, but uh, it's been the whole system's been plagued by a very slow rollout, very methodical. That's been too conservative. And it's still too conservative, but it's about to get better with new formats that will be in introduced in December. Uh, and supply constraints should, should lift by then as well. But, uh, yeah, I, I think there are way too many uh, licensed companies. There's a, a CEO, uh, Sebastian San Louis from uh, Hexo, and uh, the symbol is Hexo. And uh, he, he predicted, what was his number? Like, I don't know two thirds of all the companies will be bankrupt or something like that. That may be a little extreme. And we're not talking about, well, two thirds of Canopy and Aurora and Tilray, but we're talking about two thirds of these companies that nobody's heard of that don't really have scale. But it, it's a big number and, you know, there's going to be a big shakeout. Uh, there's, there's no reason to have this many companies. Alan, you know what's interesting is, it, you know, a year ago, uh, all the companies that we were just talking about were not even were not traded in the U.S. And now, yeah, a bunch of them are. We talk about Canopy, yeah, Freya, Organogram. Another one is, is in the new Hexo. Another one in the news this morning, uh, CTST Can Trust Holdings. Uh, they got a, uh, a a a compliance report from Health Canada saying that one of their facilities was in violation of certain regulations. Yeah, uh, down what, 17% this morning. Uh, I guess I'll ask you first about that, but then we can go broadly. Uh, is, is the can trust news, is that, is this an overreaction this morning or is, is this move in line with what health can? Yeah. It's, it's hard to tell. I, I, and I've been a big fan of can trust. It's been very disappointing to watch it play out. Uh, What's the symbol a, on that one again? CTST. CTST. Is that what you said? The symbol? Yeah. 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 CTST. Uh, so this is kind of unprecedented what was announced and there, there was Twitter was a fire apparently this weekend and uh, I wasn't sure if it was true or not, but I, I was going to fear on the weekend, but they said this morning that it, so one of the problems in, in Canada has been the very slow licensing process and apparently they took a shortcut and started growing in rooms that had not yet been approved by Health Canada. All, all the product I believe that they sold past testing and all that, it wasn't sold into the black market, which there have been a couple of instances where Health Canada has caught companies selling into the black market, which is, uh, that would be a killer. So this is a somewhat unprecedented to have uh, a company that has uh, violated the rules by selling production that it shouldn't have been producing, but it sold it into legal channels. They, I think the downside is twofold. They may have to destroy all that product, I'm not sure. That's quantifiable. It's like $40 million. It'd be a shame, but quantifiable. And certainly if that's all that happened, that would be a huge overreaction this morning. Uh, I guess there's another possibility they could lose their license and all that. Then it's probably not an overreaction. I don't think that's the way it plays out. I think as an investor, though, wow, you know, we, we trust in these companies. Can trust it. I like to say, if you can't trust, can trust, who can you trust? And <laughs> they were... They started off, uh, this guy, Eric Paul, I'm really kind of disgusted with him now uh, as I review kind of the history, but you know, he seemed to be doing things the right way. I had access to his shareholder communications going back two, three, four years ago. The company is very dedicated to medical, and this is kind of a little controversy right now because some companies are ditching Canadian medical patients uh, in, in favor of either European medical patients because they can make more money off of them 
or they're they're favoring the the adult use market uh, because they think that's where the best bet is long term. Although you can't make more money right now, so CanTrust has stayed dedicated to that. They've just raised what was it, three hundred million dollars uh, at five fifty US. Uh, uh, it seemed like an overkill, but now you have to say, well, gosh, did they know they were breaking these rules then? And that's why they took all that money. It would seem like a really low price at the time. So I think I mentioned the downside being destruction of product potentially, which is quantifiable at 40 million. Uh, it lost a license, which is just detrimental, but not likely. But the real thing is, is it really kind of shakes investors' confidence, not only in can trust and for the long term, but, but maybe in the industry. But I will say this, I say this is unprecedented, but there have been challenges to the industry like this before. I would point people to Metrum and Organogram. Metrum was acquired by Can Canopy Growth right after their similar type of issue. This is unauthorized use of pesticides. So what we're talking about is breaking the rules. And then uh, Organogram, which I mentioned earlier, is just one of the most solid stories in Canada, fought its way back took corrective actions, uh, there was some management change. So I, I would say the CEO of CanTrust should be embarrassed. He should say, I apologize and I am resigning because this happened on my duty. And this guy, this is the second time that he has sat on bad news and I think he needs to go. I will say that publicly. Uh, one more, Alan, and we'll let you go. Uh, Canada is set to uh, legalize the sale of edibles uh, yep. by October 17th, although, although we don't actually know how long it will take for them for the sales to start because there's always the, that delay there. But do you have any insights for us as to what the legalization of uh, cannabis THC drinks and edibles will be in Canada when that happens in a few months? Yeah, so, so there's three things really that are going to be important, uh, and I don't think one of them is that important. We'll see. So vape pens, hugely important. That, that is going to be a killer. Uh, secondarily, what you said was edibles, which I'll come back to. And then the third piece would be the beverages. The beverages are a real question. Beverages don't sell very well in US markets where they're permitted. And uh, the products aren't that great yet. They, they need work. Some of these companies say that their products are gonna be better, but we'll have to see. So I think there's a little bit too much uh, overconfidence about the potential impact of beverages in December when, when these sales start. But on the edibles, I'm a little bit mixed in the near term. Health Canada has done something uh, pretty detrimental, I think. Uh, they've uh, So in the United States, if you go into like Colorado or, or uh, California, you'll, you can buy like 100 milligrams of THC and it has to be broken up into 10 servings, basically. In, in Canada, you can buy 10 milligrams of THC, period. And so... The packaging is going to be very expensive. These are going to be sold. You, you may see two packs of five milligrams, so two, ser two small servings or maybe even four at two and a half, but you're restricted to 10. It's essentially one serving, but depending on how you look at it. So the cost is, is and I've, I've asked a few people, it's probably going to be about $7 a serving. And you go to California, Canada, a 10 milligram serving, when you buy it at 100 milligrams, about two two fifty with taxes, so it's going to be pretty expensive. With that said, um, I think there'll be a lot of novelty, a lot of interest in it. So hopefully, what ends up happening is the the companies get these products out, and then in six months to a year, they're able to to relax the rules a little bit and sell larger packaging. All right, Alan Broxstein is the uh, author of the Four Twenty Investor. Uh, founding partner of New Cannabis Ventures. He's our cannabis guru. Alan, thanks so much for the time and uh, have a good rest of your week. All right. Good talking to you guys. All thanks, right. Man. That was great stuff. Awesome stuff from Alan. So 8, 8.53 now. We didn't even get to Boeing today. Uh, let's talk about Boeing quickly. They lost an order, a big order uh, over the weekend. This was reported. They lost an order from uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, company fly deal that would buy up to 50 uh, planes. It it was a how big was this order? It was 18. 5.9 billion. 5.9 billion dollars. So 5.9 billion dollars going uh, from Boeing now going to Airbus from this Arabian uh, airliner here. It's a lot of unknowns here. Headline risk all over the place. We've been talking bearish about it for a while here. I don't see any reason to own Boeing here. This is too much headline risk. I don't know what the next bad headline is coming. It seems like one comes every other day. Uh, also, they set aside, I believe, a hundred million dollars for the uh, max uh, for the latest crash victims. Not 
not a big amount of money for them, but something that should be noted. Uh, technically speaking, that 380 level just popped up there a couple of weeks ago, falling back. Where it was finding support at 352 here, we are trading below that area, three, four lows in that area. Boom, got to get above 352 for a chance for a rally here. Uh, coming back on the downside, uh, you do have some daily lows. Uh, this is called 347 and 345, your two support levels um, in Boeing. But just a lot of headlines and uh, more seem to be bad than good. Oh. So t- tough to be on this stock. Back to the ratings parade. We missed a few there. Juniper. Uh, I didn't talk about this one there. City. Is it City downgrading them this morning? Spencer? It is City. Yep. City downgrading to sell. Price target on Juniper lowered from $28 to $24. Jay. Yeah. And- it's getting hit pretty good here. 3.5% here now trading down. Um, I don't know. I guess you get in the lower 26s. This is a stock that is basically going from the high of its range from the last month to the low of its range in the last month in one day. So it's that's how conservative Juniper chart has been. So I don't think I'm coming in here. And you know, if you're selling it here now, maybe a little late to the party. There's is some lows there on the 25, but I'm not necessarily coming in and buying it either. So I think it's just kind of in the middle of nowhere for me now too. Yeah, it's getting hit pretty hard. Let me see what the volume is with this. This is a fairly ah uh, thirteen thousand shares. Uh, Dennis made the point here about the trading range that it's been in since uh, June 17th. And the bottom of that range is 26.13. We're only 25 cents away from there. Uh, Also that low right under 26 here, 25.96. So opening into support here. So if you shorten this, uh, you may get a little bit of a pop uh, against you on this one. In order to get to the bottom of yesterday's range, you got fairly now 50 cents to go. I think I'd be, more inclined to try and be patient and short this thing at 26, 84 and a half. You had, uh, th- look at all those lows, one, two, three, four lows in that area. So I try and be more patient, short this thing in the strength as opposed to selling it closer to the $26 level. Net app downgrade to sell at City. There's a lot of sell ratings here yeah, this morning. Sell, yeah, net app's down almost 6% here now. So getting hit very hard on this. It's a stock that has not been performing well for a while. I mean, you can look at the charts and you can say, okay, well, I had the ugly, ugly May where everything rallied the majority of the losses back in June. This did not. This kind of just hung out. And now you're starting to break down here again through the 60 support here this morning. This thing's hanging out near the lows. And if you're looking at relative strength versus relative weakness, I mean, this thing has been the weakest of a lot of your tech stocks here for a while. And now obviously getting hit hard here again. So uh, I don't like it either. Yeah. Uh, trading near the lows of the pre-market session, pre-market low. Uh, right here, right now comes in at 58.36. You're trading just above that. And uh, I'm not sure what the news was that took it down to 58.11, but it had a hard time. I think that was earnings. Was it earnings? I think it was. Yeah, so they're at 60 cents away. That's uh, There's your target on the downside. Yeah, let's see what it does there. It's a good level drills getting. Yeah, if you were short, maybe you're bringing it in there. But I don't know if I, I, I just can't bring myself to. And it's, again, the same story. I like to buy pullbacks on stocks that are in uptrends. I don't like to buy pullbacks that are on stocks with downtrends because it seems like those ones get weaker. It's like this market, the weak get weaker, the strong gets stronger. That's why it's such a, you know, the trends are you know, like a, I'm buying weakness on stocks and uptrends. I'm selling strength on stocks and downtrends. That just continues to work. Uh, one more Morgan Stanley this morning downgrading State Street, State Street to underweight, Bank of New York to underweight, and BNY Mellon's uh, high yield vehicle to underweight. So uh, three downgrades. Banks typically don't move around that much. So I know CMA caught a downgrade here this morning too, I believe is at RJ. Um, so you're seeing multiple downgrades in the banks here this morning. But you look at this bank in New York. Okay, it's down a buck here this morning. You get down here 42, you probably find some buyers. There's, these aren't ones that really get hit. Like the, the, the betas on these things are just lower. So, you know, you, you see STT getting hit here this morning. But all kinds of support down there, $54 area. I don't think these are going to be, again, the trend is not your friend here. The banks have not been good. So I'm not necessarily coming in here and buying these, but you're following these and just selling them out of your long-term portfolio. Now, I mean, I mean, I think you're late to the party. 
All right, S and P's uh, a little bit weak. Falling here, here pretty good. Oh uh, yeah, yep. Uh, down near the lows of the pre-market session. Uh, pre-market low seventy-eight, seventy-five. Really nothing there uh, to to call that the low of the day. I'll be more looking for Friday's low at uh, twenty-nine, seventy-one and a quarter. Uh, beneath that, your weekly low is way down at twenty-nine, fifty-five. You do have the occasion. I don't know when I've seen this uh, happen in the S and P's, but uh, like your weekly swing number, uh, we're trading below it right now at twenty-nine eighty-four. So new all-time highs last week. Strong jobs number a little bit of profit taking here we'll see if it uh evolves in anything more than that the we very late earnings week we got pepsi tomorrow yep. um we got broadcom i believe on wednesday but broadcom's got the whole wild card with the semantic stuff going on i think we're gonna hear from delta um levi i believe reports this week but it's light yeah uh one thing we forgot to talk about today was tesla it's okay we'll do it tomorrow but yeah. uh Dennis has, has an, a trading idea for Tesla he wanted to discuss. So it's not could, time sensitive. So not could, time sensitive. Actually, yeah, that's that's the whole idea. It's the opposite of time sensitive. It's, the, it's a very long. <laughs> um, so I just say I do not think it's going to zero, and I might be trading it with that all, right. all in mind. I'm not saying I'm buying it, not buying it because there's a lot of risk here, but trying to make plays on it that I'm making the call that I believe it's not going to zero. And there's ways to profit. Right. We'll talk about that on Tuesday's show. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch our podcast. It's available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Google Podcasts. Thanks to our guest, Alan Brockstein. Thanks to all of you in our chats, both on YouTube and premarket.benzinga.com. Please remember all the information from our show is meant for informational purposes only, not meant to be investing or trading advice. Hope everyone had a nice, long weekend. Hope you got away from it for a minute, but we are back and we will see you on Tuesday. Have a good one.